are these seven foot aliens that have been spotted in Peru real? Or is there some sort of weird mass psychosis happening around the globe as we awaken from the illusion of a crumbling world? <laughs> Hello there, you 6.5 million awakening wonders. Thanks for joining us on our mutual voyage to truth and freedom that appears to be an intergalactic voyage these days. If Peruvian villagers are to be believed, they've seen seven foot creatures lurking in the trees. Are these miners trying to trick the villagers out of their territory with skullduggery? Or are they indeed intergalactic entities? Let's have a look at the mainstream media reporting on stories that just a few years ago would never make it that far and ask ourselves mutually together, is there some sort of fissure appearing in reality? Are our models of government and governance breaking down to the degree where we're starting to entertain almost mythic and occultist ideas of what reality is about? The nature of consciousness, the nature of being itself. Can we just dismiss this story in the way we would have done 10 years ago as, oh, these people in the forest, they're innocent, they're foolish. Because, you know, we have the wall pulled over our eyes, don't we, in advanced civilizations as well. Okay, everybody in your houses. Hey, everybody, Underwater. It may not be as graphic as seven foot creatures spied in trees, but with ongoing congressional hearings around UAP phenomena, who among us is certain anymore about the true nature of reality and our exclusive and solitary status as sentient beings in this universe? This has happened before. Miners will go in and try to scare the wits out of villagers. Where did you get so jaded? This has happened before. It's a tale as old as time. Seven foot creatures in the trees, in the jungle, being used to scare miners. By pretending to look like aliens, etc. Ben Hansen is an expert. Nice to see Brendan Fraser staying in gainful employment. The whole thing is weird, okay? So let's try to unpack this a little bit. The events, a lot of the events that are being reported are true. We have video of the authorities showing up. We have video of the villagers running out to into the jungle shooting at something, okay? I mean, if it is miners dressed as aliens, they took a bit of a risk there because, like, they could get shot. Also, I think that's almost more weird. Okay, to get these villagers to move on, I'm going to dress up as Predator and we'll go down there and freak them the fuck out. What if they shoot us, boss? Who gives a shit? Let's get mining! Woohoo! But after the investigation, what they come out with is they say that uh, the, the prosecutor says that they believe uh, the, the police investigation summarizes that these were miners protecting gold, okay, with jet packs. Then the news used to be like this when we were kids. It's always like boring. The Dow Jones Index and Nasdaq has gone up by two point nine. Miners on jet packs are pretending to be aliens. Joe Biden's kid works for a Ukrainian firm. We're inventing diseases in laboratories and letting them loose. The last one's not true. That they're flying around on jet packs with hoods and masks and glowing something and going around cutting people's throats. So let that sit just for a second. Cutting people's throats? I mean, what is this amazing? I think aliens would be like, don't worry, don't worry, it's just aliens. There are more of them. Like, congressional hearings about aliens are actually a bit boring now, aren't they? It was a cuboid shape that crossed through the sky, and I looked at my instruments and my machine, and I thought, that's certainly going quite fast. Miners cutting people's throats. One miner bashed a villager over the head with the tip of his dick. It really sounds like an episode of Scooby-Doo, where, you know, Mr. Withers puts on a goblin mask and is, is trying to protect his gold. Scooby-Doo? Well, Mr. Withers, that didn't happen to Scooby. Oh, Shaggy, I'm getting my throat cut. Oh, man, Scoob, it's getting pretty scary. That never happened in Scooby, though, did it? <laughs> Here's some of the original footage that that mainstream media news story is based on. Watch this, and then we'll talk about how occultist ideas and mythic imagination appear to be re-entering the mainstream on account of our failing systems, i.e. we're at the precipice of the new. We recognise that real change is coming. Either that real change is going to be a sort of centralised authoritarian dystopia where we all become like sort of little managed units unable to control our own lives except when confined by our change to the spot where they would have us dwell or we're going to create new models of reality, some sort of intergalactic, psychedelic, decentralised wonderland. I like the latter. In the Amazon jungle, an eerie investigation is underway. Don't do the investigation in an eerie way. There are seven foot alien creatures or mad crazy miners in this region. That's why I want you to dress up as Buffy the Vampire Slayer and you to put on this bondage gear and get down there and freak ourselves out. Huh, who said that? It was me. <laughs> do the investigation in a normal way. After reports of bizarre occurrences in a village, it's not that bizarre, it's just like a bloke dressed as Maradona in 1980, standing in the woods. Look at those bastards. One in red, one in blue. Ah, ah, 
Primary colors! Primary colors! The locals claim they are being menaced by seven F feet tall armored aliens with large heads and yellow eyes in Peru. That actually, I think, is Predator, though, that one. Hold on a minute, there's Arnold Schwarzenegger's catching him. Bullshit. Locals describe creatures resembling the Green Goblin from the Spider-Man franchise. That is actually the Green Goblin. These astonishing claims have emerged from the Ikitu indigenous people, residing in the remote district of Alto Nane, northeast of Lima. Of course, these people likely have ceremonies that give them access to levels of consciousness that we would regard as quite bizarre in themselves. They probably have a different relationship with nature, kind of relationship that we would have had with nature if we hadn't allowed ourselves to be farmed off and zooed off into a kind of little prison planet. Their mythic imagination probably has symbols and embodies deep emotional concepts, deep psychic forces that are inaccessible to us. They probably have a different way of experiencing realities. So they probably open to different types of experience. But nevertheless, let's not forget that at the moment, Congress are engaged in what they now call UAP hearings to investigate fighter pilots ongoing sightings and whistleblowers within various military institutions are saying, we've seen aircraft, we've seen alien corpses. So perhaps there's an intersectional point between these kind of sightings and our mythic imagination. Most of the indigenous histories of like Northern Europe, African nations, Scandinavia, Japan, all of us seem to have some shared memory of occupying this planet with other types of species other types of beings. That doesn't mean it's hocus pocus. One of the problems of rationalism and materialism is it sort of fenced us into a space where we can't imagine new solutions. And when you come to a precipitous time like now, where it's like, oh God, all these wars, all of this lying, all of this fracture, you can't summons on anything more powerful. You can't call up a shared experience or a deep wisdom to get us past the crisis we're currently in. Various theories surround these enigmatic sightings, ranging from real extraterrestrial beings to creatures from local folklore. Others suggest it could be a case of mass hysteria. It could be mass hysteria. What do you mean mass hysteria? You know, like everyone getting scared of something because this idea got propagated that there was something to be scared of and you had to lock yourself in your homes and stand a certain distance apart and dress up in crazy costumes and masks and stuff like that. But people that were really powerful just carried on as normal. No, nah, that could never happen. The mystery deepens as authorities seek to uncover the truth behind these perplexing claims. Now, obviously we have to have sponsorship as part of our funding model in order for us to bring you this fantastic content. If these products are useful, please consider purchasing them and stay to the end because I'll try and make the advert a little bit funny. We can't make our content without help. Now, according to some headlines, the American economy is on its way back. But before you send Joe Biden a thank you card that he probably won't read anyway, if he still does read thank you cards, you might want to consider these worrying facts. Credit card debt and auto loan balances have pushed America's debt into over $1 trillion of money for the first time. And a year after Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, the Federal Reserve still sees significant inflation risk and warns that could lead to further interest rate rises. So you might want to consider some alternative safe for havens for your hard-earned cash, such as Fine art. And thanks to our sponsor, Masterworks, ordinary investors can now benefit from the soaring value of contemporary art too by joining a movement that has outpaced the S&P 500 for the last 27 years by 136%. You didn't know I knew that, but I do know that. Which is good news for you, but bad news for patronizing and elitist members of the art world who don't want people like you poking around in their Bankses and their Basquiats. Masterworks has already sold over $45 million of art with the net proceeds paid out to ordinary stinking blue collar common folks like you, ordinary investors with no connections to the traditional art world. So skip the wait list and get started today by following my link in the description, masterworks.art slash brand. Art for common people. Get out of it. And check out the important disclosures at the address on screen now. Let's get into this and see why the occult appears to be coming into the mainstream with an essay from our friend Daniel Pintrick. As the religious historian Monsieur Eliard explored in his 1974 essay, The Occult and the Modern World, the word occult was first coined in the 16th century. It meant what is not apprehended or not apprehensible by the mind, beyond the range of understanding or of ordinary knowledge. Later on, it gained another meaning, identifying those ancient and medieval reputed sciences held to involve the knowledge or use of agencies of a secret and mysterious nature 
magic, alchemy, astrology, theosophy. At the most basic level, a cult seems synonymous with hidden. Is there a deeper reality making itself known to us? Eliard sought the roots of the craze for the occult that had overtaken the young people of his day. It could be explained, he believed, by the attraction of a personal initiation. As is well known, Christianity rejected the mystery religion type of secret initiation. Occult initiation confers a new status on the adept. He feels that he is somehow elected, singled out from the anonymous and lonely crowd. Moreover, in most of the occult circles, initiation also has a super personal function for every new adept is supposed to contribute to the renovatio of the world. Our old models are failing and fading. Many people, young people, people of all ages, feel uprooted, lost, disconnected. I believe the rise of extremist groups, even the return to ethno-nationalism, is a rejection of globalism, an empty, hollow, commodifying models. Models of commerce where we are told our sole function is to consume. We're beginning to recognise that sugary food does little more than provide us with a temporary high and long-term obesity and diabetes. We're beginning to recognise that our screens hypnotise, numb us and dumb us down. We are reaching for a depth that is present within our shared mythology, within the spiritual experience, and is seemingly now encroaching upon ordinary physical understanding of politics, the cosmos and reality itself. Eliard's characterization remains accurate. Almost all cultures around the world, with the glaring exception of modern industrial society, practice some form of initiation. The essential function of initiatory rituals is to force a direct experience of a non-ordinary or transpersonal state of consciousness. The candidate attains this by undergoing a particular set of ordeals that may include fasting, dark retreats, walkabouts, ingesting visionary plants and so on. In these societies, a person would not be seen as a mature adult until they'd passed through the transpersonal gateway. Now what is adulthood? A driving test, a crap job, a brief time at an educational institution that leaves you in debt? When do you become a man, a woman, an adult, a member of society? And what is our shared goal? How do we marshal these powerful resources within us? I'm not talking about psychic forces now, unless you consider emotions like sorrow, regret, joy, agony, anger, as being deep psychic forces, and in a way they are, aren't they? And really all society offers us now is means to repress, control, distraction from these forces, rather than a embodiment and realisation of them. First comes direct experience, then the myriad ways one can understand and interpret such an experience. Since the beginning of Christianity, modern movements of occultism in the Anglo-European world have sought to devise new systems of initiation while providing new interpretive frameworks for understanding these categories. Vast domains of human experience that scientism dismisses as worthless. By scientism, Pinchbeck means only that which can be measured, weighed and observed has value. But even your own subjective experience is a total and unique mystery to you. The fact that there are archetypal and shared common experiences among us provides the opportunity for ceremony, connection, embracing and representing the mystery through culture, art, dance, music, theatre, ways of recognising we are all one. What does your culture offer you now? Sort of tribalistic wars, reductivism, commerce. Occult philosophy posits that our world is shaped and guided by invisible or super sensible forces. Think of your own life. Is it that which is just practical, the pursuit of money? Why do you want to make money for? Or falling in love? Why do you want to fall in love? When you investigate all of your goals and objectives, there is usually some invisible, difficult to discern force behind it. Our culture prescribes ideas and modalities that are ineffective at dealing with the deepest human experiences. That we have to find new ways of resolving or simply resort to numbing them or ignoring them. Consciousness exists in some as of yet unknown way beyond the confines of the physical brain. In fact, what we currently experience is the physical universe may be an epiphenomenon, a transitory fluctuation within consciousness, an infinite field of potentiality itself. Eastern mysticism speaks of consciousness as the one without a second. That means it is absolute. How many of us describe and understand God? 20th century physicists similarly found to their shock that the universe acts more like a great thought than a machine. The Nobel Prize winning discovery that the universe is not locally real supports this new ancient understanding which makes consciousness, not physical stuff, the foundation of reality. Either consciousness is a result of physical and biological processes, or there was a point where physical and biological processes granted access to a consciousness that preceded it and was ever present. Consciousness certainly appears to be rather complex, difficult to describe, difficult to discern, and difficult to break down. And one reason for that could be is it precedes mechanical understanding of reality. Where can we find the basis for the new paradigm capable of rescuing humanity from its current doom spiral? Because surely that's what we're in. The ridiculed and outcast domain of a cult or hermetic philosophy is where we must look. This would accord with a little-known
own esoteric law. The periphery and the center can, at certain times and quite suddenly, switch places. Have you noticed in our culture that the left and the right appear to be shifting? That we're told that authoritarianism is necessary because of compassion. That war is necessary because of compassion. That meaning itself seems to be shifting. The meaning of words. Presumably consistent phenomena such as biology and biological identity appear to be shifting. I'm not talking about the rights of people within a culture to be whoever they feel themselves to be. That's a right I would afford anybody. But the questioning of the framework of our reality has become commonplace. The inability to express certain concerns is becoming more and more regular. Jeffrey Kripal is the rare academic to acknowledge the validity of psychic and paranormal events. Such episodes, he notes, refute the dualism and deconstruct the presumed objectivity of Western thought and science. These events reveal the interruption of meaning in the physical world via the radical collapse of the subject object structure itself. I consider myself to be me and everything else outside of me. But I breathe in the outside world all the time. I eat the outside world all the time. In my dreams, all of the phenomena that occurs is within my own consciousness. And actually, when I think about it, in my waking life, I only know the part of you that I know. I only know the part of my wife that I know. My wife, in essence, exists within my awareness. Even my intimate relationships are reduced to objects in my awareness. In short, the outside world and inside world are one thing. I don't know what it's like to be inside my wife's head. I don't know what's happening in in Delaware or Alaska right now, or what's happening at the depth of the sea, or even what's happening in my own gut. There are such limitations to our subjective personal experience, and so much of how we receive reality is how we've been told it is. That's why the media is powerful and dangerous, because they can just tell, this is Russia, this is Wuhan, and you just have to kind of accept it. More than accidents, they illuminate a literary or even mythic quality running across the surface of our seemingly mundane lives, as if the world itself is a work of art, a poem to be interpreted, not an equation to be be solved. Kripal notes that psychic phenomena are not considered to be part of the history of religion, even though scriptures are full of descriptions of such events, the miracles. He defines the psychical as the sacred in transition from a traditional religious register into a modern scientific one. We do need to investigate new ways of interpreting reality. We do need to marshal and access new forces if we are to progress. Otherwise, we're caught between the extraordinary analysis of UAPs on one hand and the semi-mythic interpretation of potential extraterrestrials or dressed up miners in a Peruvian village. We no longer have a cultural template that can service our deep conscious forces. That which is not easy to discern, describe or delineate exists yet and we have no means for understanding it, interpreting it, acculturating it, ritualizing it. All of this remains a kind of blur, a mystery. So we find ourselves incredibly passionate about sport or angry about cultural events or immersed in a movie that's manipulative and hollow because we don't have ceremony, ritual, culture, in short, historic and traditional means of marshalling, controlling and directing forces that have been with us for as long as we've been human, maybe even longer. The word telepathy, he notes, was only coined in the late 19th century by researchers associated with the Society of Psychical Research in London, which applied scientific methods to the study of paranormal and supernatural effects. Until today, the scientific mainstream has rejected all efforts to legitimise the investigation of psychic and paranormal phenomena, whether made by the Society of Psychical Research in London in the 19th century or the Institute of noetic studies in more recent decades. As author John Michael Greer notes, these efforts to bridge the gap between science and the psychic or paranormal do not fail because the psychic effects are not real. They fail because modern science has always defined its identity in opposition to occultism and any time the magis come up with something that comes too close to science, the scientists simply move the goalposts. We recognise that reality sprung from a sub-molecular, highly dense piece of matter with all the rules of life baked in. There are events in our cosmic trajectory that remain utterly inexplicable and in fact contradict the model of analysis elsewhere. A period of radical inflation when it comes to the expansion of the universe. Giant gaps in our evolutionary history. Consistent motifs throughout culture, particularly and specifically including beings that come from the sky. Non-human entities. Every religion includes such accounts. All folklore includes such accounts. And our common shared yet deeply private dreams appear to include motifs like these as well. Traditional indigenous societies carefully structure initiation processes. Elders guide younger candidates through their visionary journeys into the other world, providing a context for them through the legends and philosophy of the community. In those societies, psychic, supernatural and paranormal phenomena are recognised as part of the fabric of reality. In a society that offers you nothing but commerce, commodity, 
eating and consuming in place of the deep, ancient, potent roles people like us would once have held. There's a danger of a kind of collective nihilism. When we remain uninitiated, disconnected from nature, oblivious to our deep psychic lives, then it's likely that we have hysterical eruptions like the one that we saw in Peru. It's likely that we have extraordinary corruption, bizarre wars that don't make sense, peculiarly corrupt leaders that tell us stories that don't hold up to scrutiny, vast pandemics that induce hysteria and fear that are never fully or properly explained. The fact is, you know and I know, we all engage with a deep mystery. We live in a conscious and subjective world that no one but ourselves fully truly understands. We recognise that simultaneously we are infinitesimally small and yet all reality takes place, as far as we know, solely within our unique and particular awareness. Without initiation, without a collective awakening, without new social models that reflect the complexity, beauty and particularness of our human experience, I believe we are on the precipice of a very unique type of destruction, hopefully from which can come a radical rebirth and new systems and new ideologies, but maybe not. Maybe it will just be destruction. But that's just what I think. Why don't you let me know what you think in the comments below? If you enjoyed this weird and fantastic video, have a look at either of these. Remember, we make our show in the other place every day. Join us over there. Turn on the notification bell and subscribe. Listen to our audio podcast while you drive, while you work, while you walk and while you garden. But more important than any of that is that if you can, Please stay free.